Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Raz Jelinek. Uh, I am uh, the Vice President and Dean for Research and Development in the BGU. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce and, or to open the Kreitman Lecture uh, in this 49 uh, Board of Governors meeting. Uh, before I tell you a little bit about the Autism Center, uh, which we're very proud of, I can tell you that already. Uh, I'll uh, tell you a few words about the Kreitman uh, family and uh, their generosity uh, that really uh, should be um, emphasized. Um, so um, Irene and uh, Hyman Kreitman, uh, you saw their uh, pictures outside, uh, their vision has allowed so many students and uh, researchers to be successful, uh, to fulfill their goals. Uh, they supported wide variety of social uh, programs on campus. And of course, uh, physical landmarks that you can all see around us. Among them, uh, the Kreitman Plaza and building, uh, which is the center of campus. Uh, they create an atmosphere and beauty that is unique to Ben Gurion University. Uh, the Kreitman uh, Foundation Fellowships, which are um, the bedrock of uh, graduate uh, student uh, research and support in this university. Uh, these uh, uh, fellowships are given to exceptional, excellent uh, graduate students and help us to be competitive uh, with other universities in Israel. Uh, the Kreitman School of Advanced Graduate Studies is the uh, unit that's responsible for all our administrative issues regarding a uh, graduate student. And uh, we're happy to see a uh, Professor Dudi Bartz be sitting here, who's the dean of the Kreitman School. Thanks, Dudi. Um, the graduates uh, of the Kreitman School of Advanced uh, Studies, Advanced Graduate Studies, uh, it's good to know they number 3,570 students so far. This is really an exceptional number, and um, all these students are, are spread all over Israel. Uh, in academia, industry, business. And uh, thanks for the generous support of the Kreitman, they help uh, make BGU a very important brand in Israel. So these are just some of uh, examples uh, where the Kreitman's family uh, generosity has led to a successful generation of, of academic uh, excellence in this university, and it's too bad that they're not with us, uh, but we really have to be, um, and we are, very thankful and grateful for uh, the Kreidman family. Um, now about the Autism Center. So uh, um, let me just veer off the script, because I want to say things which are a little personal. Uh, uh, Professor Ilan Dinstein, the head of the Autism Center, is going to introduce the center and tell us a little bit about it. Uh, I told you we are very proud of the center. It's, it's really a, a core of excellence of this university um, in which diverse uh, studies from physiology to psychology to social sciences, they all uh, brought together to address uh, autism and we're gonna hear about it um, today. But I, I'd, like to, I'd like to tell you something kind of on a more personal level, uh, which is why I really think the Autism Center is something very unique, and um, that's why we are very proud of. Um, you know, it's very important to, and we, we keep emphasizing uh, excellence, uh, multidisciplinarity, um, groundbreaking research, this is extremely important. But one thing that sometimes is missing or, or not emphasized enough in, in our science, in our studies, is, is the human dimension. And I think when we think of the Autism Center, the human dimension really comes up as central. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm a, my wife is a developmental psychologist. She's working with aut autistic children and with their families, uh, with parents uh, mostly. And I, uh, you know, and I hear um, stories on, on the dinner table uh, about a really heartbreaking stories about autistic children and how to cope with autistic children or with this autism. But there's two things that, that always come up. One thing is compassion and another thing is hope. And really one thing that is unique and important about the Autism Center is it really has these two extremely important terms at the core of of the agenda at the core of the research. And, and, and for this, I think we should all be grateful. Um, thank you, Ilan, for doing this, for, for being responsible for this. Uh, as I said, we're very proud of the center. We keep supporting the center. We hope you're going to grow and, and, and help families and maybe solve autism one day. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Raz. What, what an intro. Um, okay. Uh, so as you can see, I'm, I'm very excited, and it's a, it's a real great pleasure um, to tell you about the National Autism Center that we're building here at BGU. Uh, so, so this whole uh, project started about a year and a half ago when the Ministry of Science announced uh, an opportunity, a grant opportunity, uh, to create a national center. Um, and uh, this was actually a, a, an earthquake because the Israeli government had never before uh, given any funding to, to create infrastructure to do autism research in the country. And so as you might imagine, all the major universities uh, applied for this, the Hebrew University, Tel Aviv, Weizmann, Haifa, Barilan, Tel Ashomer. And, uh, and luckily for us, we, we beat them all and we won it here at BGU, uh, which was extremely... <laughs> Um, which was very exciting for us, and, but, but also comes with, with this very big responsibility of delivering in, in creating a national center. Um, and so what, uh, what I'd like to, to do over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, uh, together with my partners, who I'll introduce in a few moments, uh, is to tell you about uh, the work that we've been doing at BGU over several years now that led up to us, to us winning this, uh, this grant. Um, and, okay, so let's do that. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with my own initial story, and uh, I'll start by showing you uh, this handsome character here, the third from the left. This is my father, uh, Professor Yitzhak Dinstein, who is an emiratus professor, emeritus professor uh, from electrical engineering. And so I actually have the honor of being the second generation in the family business. And, and continuing the tradition. And so I came to, uh, to BGU in, in 2012 and opened up a neuroimaging lab in the psychology department. Uh, I come from a background of neuroscience. I do a lot uh, of MRI research and EEG. Uh, and the focus of this research that uh, together with, uh, with the wonderful students in my lab is to try and understand what happens uh, to children, uh, typically very early in development, uh, what happens to their brain in terms of both the, its structure and its function, and to try and answer questions about what might be changing in children who develop autism in contrast to typically developing kids. So in order for us to start talking about autism, I first have, we first, I want to make sure that everybody uh, knows what it means. So, so you've probably been exposed to this term in the popular literature. Uh, there have been many articles and movies and books over the last several, uh, actually a decade or two. And this is happening because of this very large increase in prevalence. So today in the US, we're talking about one out of 59 children who are diagnosed with autism. And it's, the numbers are similar. They're, about, uh, they're over 1% in most of the Western world. And, and this means that 1% um, of the children who are born today will be diagnosed with autism and will require substantial support throughout their lives. This is a, a lifelong uh, disorder. And that's, that's rather frightening and, and uh, is a topic of much uh, interest, of course, scientifically and medically. So if we uh, dive a bit deeper and look at the, the, the actual um, 
definition of autism, uh, you can find it in the DSM. This is the Bible for psychiatry. Today we're up to the fifth uh, version of this book. And if you look uh, inside the DSM, you'll see that there are two core symptoms that define autism. The first one is social communication difficulties. And the second one is repetitive behaviors and confined interests. So these are rather vague definitions, right? What does it mean to have a social communication difficulty? Uh, my wife tells me I have lots of communication difficulties all the time, right? Um, and, and so when physicians interact with, with, with uh, young children, uh, they, they focus on, on behaviors that are important for interaction. So things like eye contact and, and whether the child uh, comes and initiates and tries to engage the clinician or the parents or other people who are sitting in the room and as you uh, might imagine, children with autism tend to avoid, they don't look at the face, they typically don't look at the eyes, they tend to avoid social interactions, and they prefer to be on their own. So they might find a corner in the room and play with, with a toy, um, and uh, they often do these, uh, uh, these repetitive behaviors that um, include things like stereotypical movements. So they might have some kind of repetitive behavior like this, with rocking of the body and, and flicking of the hand. Um, they'll have confined interest. They might play with a certain toy repetitively, like spinning the wheel of a car, um, or they might uh, be only interested in one topic, like train locomotors, and they will not want to engage on any other topic. And the combination of these two symptoms, you can probably get a feeling that, that they, really, uh, they really impair the ability of a child to develop. They, they hinder all of the social experiences that we often take for granted. So that's the formal definition of autism, but autism is actually much more heterogeneous than that. And, and there are many other symptoms, they're often called the secondary symptoms of autism, uh, that are common, and each individual will typically exhibit a certain set of, of, of a variety of symptoms at different uh, levels of severity. So here uh, you can see a few examples. For example, the, uh, this child here on the left who is, uh, who is covering uh, his ears, that's a uh, response that you see in some kids with autism who have very strong sensory sensitivities. So they, they might find uh, noises uh, aversive, uh, visual, also flickering lights like fluorescent lighting often is, is troubling to some kids. So that's one, uh, uh, one example. Another example is the child you see on the bottom uh, who has, uh, this is an example of a genetic disorder called Fragile X. Uh, with, where um, autism is often accompanied with other symptoms. Here you see some morphological uh, signs such as a wide uh, forehead and large ears, and, and there are often additional symptoms to each genetic disorder. Uh, then the child on the top uh, is, is displaying a tantrum. Okay, so uh, these kind of challenging behaviors are often, are sometimes apparent in some of the children. They can actually be violent. Um, they, they can be self-injurious. They might bang their, their head on the floor or on a wall. Uh, they might try to bite or scratch other people in the room, especially if, if, there's an, uh, uh, if they're anxious. Um, and then, in, in addition to these challenging symptoms that appear in some kids but not in others, there are also some very, uh, um, uh, very amazing qualities that come out in other cases of, of individuals with autism. And, and I've chosen to share with you three cases. This is uh, Temple Grandin, who is a famous advocate uh, for the autism community. She actually had very severe autism uh, to begin with. She started speaking only at the age of five or six, I think, but then developed language and went on and went to university, completed a PhD, did very well in the meatpacking industry, and has become a spokesman. She's written several books. She, there's a movie about her, and she gives amazing lectures. She, she, she has become very, uh, a great representative for the community. Uh, another example is Carly Fleischmann, who uh, was thought uh, to be very developmentally delayed by her parents and her therapist. They thought that uh, she had very low IQ. She didn't speak. She hasn't spoken to this day. And yet, at the age of 13, when a therapist sat next to her with a computer, she started typing. And, and so she is now able to communicate uh, through a computer and is, is now writing a book and she, has, she com uh, uh, communicates through social media and she has followers uh, and she describes her experience as being autistic and, and why she does a lot of the, uh, uh, she, does, she has self-injurious behaviors, for example. Uh, she says it's because of a sensory overload. And then a final example is uh, Stephen uh, Wiltshire from uh, the UK who 
has this amazing, uh, he's an amazing artist. He goes on helicopter rides above cities, and then he lands and paints the city with such accuracy that as, to, as the number of windows in the building is correct, okay? So, um, and he barely speaks, he's minimally verbal. So you have this, the reason I'm getting into all these details is to give you a feeling for, for this huge heterogeneity, and there's a sentence in the autism community that if you know one child with autism, you know one child with autism. And, and we're hoping that that's extreme, because if that's the case, we're really in trouble. But, but what I'm trying to get at is that there's this large heterogeneity, both in the core symptoms and the many accompanying symptoms um, that, that happen in autism. And this is really driving a very important shift in the research world of autism, uh, because it's making us understand that autism is not a single disorder, but rather a family of distinct disorders and each one of these different disorders will likely require a different, likely has a different cause and will require a different uh, solution, different types of interventions. And so this realization, which is sinking in into the, uh, why is this such a big deal for the research world? So, so scientists, kind of like individuals with autism, we like to work in our own separate labs. We each have a topic that we're obsessed about and we like to study very deeply. And so traditional research, uh, I, you know, if I were running a neuroimaging experiment, I would typically recruit 20 or 30 subjects, run my experiment, and publish a paper. And the lab next door, there would be a geneticist who would recruit their own 20 or 30 subjects, run their genetic experiment, and publish that paper. But then we wouldn't be able to relate our findings, right? Because if each one of us is studying their own subsample of, of cases, there's no, you know, they're not necessarily related. And so this is a huge problem and it's great motivation to build a, a shared uh, research center and have everyone work in a multidisciplinary fashion on the same children. And that's critical. Working on the same children is really critical. And so we realized this already several years ago and, um, and created what we initially called the Negev Autism Center, which is a precursor to this National Autism Center. And what I'd like to do now, I'll show you a, a short animated film that describes uh, our work in the center and our, our, uh, our workflow. So here we go. Over the last two years, scientists from Ben Gurion University and physicians from Soroka Medical Center have been building the Negev Autism Center. This is the first center in Israel that combines community clinical care and autism research in the same location. Approximately 150 children with autism are diagnosed at Soroka Medical Center every year. The diagnosis of autism requires multiple visits in which clinicians interview the parents and directly assess the behavior of the child in order to determine whether an autism diagnosis is appropriate. By integrating the research into the diagnosis visits and later follow-up visits, scientists at BGU are able to collect a wide variety of data from a large number of children without requiring additional visits to the lab. <laughs> this data includes detailed information about the child and family from the Soroka Electronic Patient Record System. Behavioral information from voice and video recordings of the child during interactions with the clinical staff, parental questionnaires about sensory sensitivities and sleep habits, saliva samples for genetic testing, blood samples for metabolic testing, eye tracking while watching TV, and even EEG recordings during sleep. This research is unique and extremely rare on a global scale because it combines a wide variety of data from each of the children that are captured at the earliest stages of their development when autism symptoms are first emerging. Today, scientists around the world agree that autism is not one disorder, but rather a family of distinct disorders that are likely to have different causes. By combining multiple types of data, the interdisciplinary team at the Negev Autism Center hopes to identify these distinct subgroups of children and match each subgroup with the most efficacious targeted treatments. 
These qualities and goals make the Negev Autism Center the leader in translational autism research in Israel and the entire Middle East. Um, so this is where we were a couple of years ago in, in 2017. Um, and I just want to emphasize one really important point here, which is very unique to the way we do our work, and, and that's the, the scientific and medical interaction. This, this cooperation between researchers and physicians is actually something very rare that, that uh, barely exists in the world. In, in this situation where uh, we have our students and research assistants integrated in the clinics where uh, the, the families get their diagnosis and then their follow-ups, this is an, an amazing situation for us because we don't have to bring the families into uh, and recruit them to, for studies in the university. We just capture all of the information on the way in clinical meetings that they have to go to anyway. And this has worked very, very well for us in, in, in generating a massive database. So before I show you a few details about the database, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the, to the partners in this effort. So I have the pleasure of telling you about this, but it's definitely not a one-man show. Um, and so, uh, so here we are, and first I'd like to introduce you to Gal Meiri, who is sitting right there. Dr. Gal Meiri is a, a child psychiatrist. He runs the preschool psychiatry unit in Soroka. Um, he single-handedly uh, uh, diagnoses over 100 cases of autism every year. And he is the, the, really the clinical expertise for autism in the entire Negev. So all of the committee meetings and, and all of the recommendations that go to the municipalities and the health ministry, um, uh, he, he's in charge of all of that. He also takes care of uh, many of the treatment uh, programs in the actual kindergartens where, where kids with autism get their intervention. And in addition to all this crazy clinical work, uh, he still has time and patience to, to think about uh, clinical research, and he'll come up in a few minutes and tell you about uh, the, the topics that interest him there. And then uh, next, Dr. Idan Menashe, who's, hi, Idan. <laughs> Idan is a geneticist and uh, an epidemiologist. Um, Idan created uh, the, the first genetics database for autism in Israel. Um, and that's no easy thing. This requires a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of authorizations from a variety of government offices and IRB boards and Helsinki committees, and, and it's, it's really extremely difficult. Not only that, he's also integrated our work in, in a very large international effort called the Autism Sequencing Consortium, which is the largest uh, genetic uh, effort in the world. And, uh, and he's, or, he's already sequenced uh, about the genetics of about 200 families in the uh, shared database. And then, uh, save the best for last, so Professor Chava Golan, who is a cellular and molecular biologist. And, and we joke that Chava is the only real researcher because she actually wears a white lab coat and goes into a, a wet lab and, and works both with animals and molecules. Um, and, and Chava uh, is doing a lot of translational work in uh, first figuring out what, is, what are b different biological mechanisms of autism in animal models, in mice, and then figuring out how to uh, treat the mice with, uh, with, with some unique uh, compounds. And then the, the idea is to then translate that understanding to humans and uh, to children, okay? So, so to actually develop new therapies. And so together, I hope you can see how we complement each other in the, the expertise and the type of research that each one of us does uh, and, and how we uh, apply it together. So all the people that you see behind us, that's the big research team. These are all research assistants and, and clinical uh, staff and, and a variety of others. And together, we've uh, already created uh, uh, the Negev database, you might call it. Uh, which contains uh, information from over a thousand families. So these are most of the autism cases in the Negev over the last three or four years. And, and this is really huge because this is a population database. It's not biased, it's not, uh, it doesn't depend on families coming to the university. It's the true uh, uh, depiction of what happens with autism in the Negev and there's a tremendous amount uh, of things that you can learn from a, from a shared database like this. Uh, we typically meet the families or, or the children very early, 
Uh, we're very interested in those very early years in understanding why the children develop differently uh, when, when they uh, have autism. So about two-thirds of the children are, are under the age of three and a half or four. Uh, we have the typical four to one male to female ratio, uh, which is uh, the same throughout the world. Male are, males are four times as likely to have autism uh, than females. The vast majority were born in Soroka, which is a huge advantage. Soroka is a healthcare monopoly of the Negev. You'll hear about a, a little more about that uh, next. So there's a tremendous amounts of clinical information that we can access and, and use as we try to figure out what's causing mm -hmm. autism. And then finally, we have this very unique Bedouin population in the Negev who make up about a quarter of the database. Um, uh, the Bedouin are very interesting in several respects. They, they, uh, one aspect is intrafamilial mar marriages. About two thirds of the parents uh, of these children are first cousins because of the tendency to marry within tribes. And that's a very unique situation to do genetic research in. So now that I've told you about the center, um, we're going to switch gears, and uh, the four of us are going to take turns uh, quickly show, uh, uh, we'll quickly show you a few examples of the actual studies that we run so you can get a feeling for, uh, for the science. Um, so I'll start with, with a few examples of, of neuroscience and uh, a couple of projects that, that develop new technologies for quantifying behavior in, in children with autism. So as I told you, I'm a neuroscientist, and, and this is also an opportunity, by the way, to, uh, to tell you about the many other collaborators in Ben Gurion who are also uh, participating in this research. Professor Ilan Shelef is one of them. He is the chief radiologist of Soroka, which means that he's in charge of all the MRI scans, the clinical ones that happen in the hospital. There's a huge amount of MRI scans uh, happening every day, and it turns out that many of the children in our database about 20 to 25 percent of them have brain MRI scans in the clinical records in Soroka. And this is a gold mine. Just, just for comparison, other groups have to make a huge effort to get these, this kind of data, and we actually have it for free right here in our backyard. And so to demonstrate the, the power of this, uh, I'll just show you one example of one project. What, what you see here up top on the left corner is an example of a child that has an excess of cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, you see that here in this white portion or in the right panel, in, in, it's in, depicted in black. And cerebrospinal fluid is a fluid that covers all of our brain from, uh, from all sides. It, ask, it acts as a short, sort of a shock absorber uh, so that when you receive trauma, your brain uh, isn't uh, impaired as much. Um, but having an excess amount of cerebrospinal fluid like this is, is very problematic because it creates pressure on the front of the brain. And having that during early development will alter the way, uh, might alter the way that, uh, that the front parts of the brain uh, develop. And we find this in about 7 to 8% of autism cases in our database. And this is much higher than, than in the typical population. And so our hypothesis is that this might be one mechanism of, of one particular subgroup of kids with autism. And so we're following up on that. We can do a variety of other measures with the same scans. Today, we apply lots of computer science. We can identify brain areas automatically and look at their volume and, and thickness and all sorts of measures. So that's brain structure. Okay, that's one project. Another project that we run together with uh, Professor Ariel Trasiuk from the physiology department. Ariel is, uh, is an expert on sleep. And so sleep is a huge problem in about half the kids with autism. They have insomnia. They sleep about half the amount that they should during the night. And if, if you're parents, you know how sleep deprived you were anyway when you had small kids, right? So having a, a child with insomnia is one of the biggest complaints. And so what we do is we bring in the children for an overnight EEG exam in the sleep lab in Soroka. And uh, here you see my eight-year-old daughter, uh, Roni, sleeping. My daughters actually fight over who gets to go to the sleep lab. Um, and so you see what her brain activity looks like while, while she's sleeping. Uh, that was deep sleep, and now you see light sleep. And I hope you, you notice the difference. Deep sleep are very high amplitude, slow waves, and, and light sleep is much faster. So it turns out that in those children with autism who have uh, insomnia, have the sleep problems, they have much less of those deep sleep segments. We shift during the night between these two stages. Um, so they have much less of these uh, deeper stages and their waves are much uh, shallower in amplitude. And so that gives us uh, uh, many thoughts about the potential mechanism and how to treat 
uh, these particular kids. So uh, moving on to behavior, this is work that we do together with uh, Professor Ofer Donchin from Biomedical Engineering and Andrei Scharf from Computer Science. Uh, here we look at the behavior of the child in the clinical assessment room. Uh, this is uh, what we're measuring here is the interaction between the child and a clinician. And using computer vision, we can actually isolate the location of the child, the location of the clinician, their parents that are sitting here next to the wall. So we get a, an image of the entire clinical room, and we can tell how the child is interacting with everyone in that room. So we can measure how much the child approaches or avoids the clinician. We can measure the distance between the child and the clinician throughout, uh, throughout the session. And as you might imagine, children with more severe symptoms, they tend to be further away from the clinician, they tend to avoid the clinician. And so this gives us an objective measure of the child's behavior and we can do this longitudinally and see whether they improve or deteriorate over time across sessions, things like that. Another measure that uh, we really like, this is a project together with uh, Professor uh, Carmel Sofer from uh, Cognitive and Brain Sciences. Uh, this is identifying facial expressions in children, also automatically with computer vision. Uh, what you can do uh, with these kind of video clips is tell whether the child is engaged, uh, how angry, uh, happy, sad, surprised they are on, on specific, uh, uh, during specific time points. And as you might imagine, children with autism, they tend to express themselves less. They're much flatter. And so now we have a, a quantitative measure of this. And then a one final example, just because I can't resist showing you my daughters. Uh, this is a movie that, that many of the children with autism see when they come to our center. And what we do, each green dot here, is the location of the eye gaze of an individual child as they're watching this movie. So this is called eye tracking. We're tracking the location of their eyes. Okay, so you can see some, some sisterly love here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not sure if she should smile or... Okay, so let me, let me stop it for a second. And um, I mentioned that children with autism are, are less engaged in social interactions. They tend not to, um, uh, not to look at eyes region and, and things like that. So, so what we can do with, this kind, with these kind of measures, we can quantify the amount of time that each individual looked at the face area of the two girls versus how much time they spent looking at other things. And, and you can imagine that the more severe cases of autism, they tend not to look at the faces enough and they look more at other uh, uh, stimuli in these frames, this gives us a measure of how interested they are in social interactions. So we can use that also. And together, this combination of measuring brain structure, brain function, and uh, behavior gives us an amazing infrastructure for identifying subgroups of, of kids with autism who differ on these uh, different dimensions, and also for measuring how children change over time, which is just super critical for clinical tests. So any clinical intervention that you can think of, you would want to know how these measures change before and after the clinical therapy. And that's where we're going with all this infrastructure. Okay, so that's my cue to invite uh, Dr. Idan Menashe, our amazing geneticist and epidemiologist, who will come and tell you about some, some research on genetic and environmental risk factors. Thank you, Ilan, for the introduction. So I have a background in genetic and epidemiology, and I'm, uh, as part of my studies here, I'm, I'm also interested in the genetic and environmental risk factors of autism. So we know that both genetics and environmental factors contribute to the risk of autism, and in our center, we study both of them. So for the genetic studies, uh, we obtained DNA from saliva samples from both affected children and their parents. We take these samples and send them to a specialized lab in the United States for sequencing. This is a lab that is part of the Autism Sequencing Consortium that, as Ilan mentioned, is the largest uh, genetic initiative in the world. They sequence these the DNA samples and send the, uh, the sequences back to us. When we receive these uh, sequences, uh, we, we use a state-of-the-art computer software to analyze these sequences and try to identify the genes that may explain autism in these families. We already uh, collected DNA samples from 
over than 200 uh, families and sequenced 65 of them. And by analyzing this, uh, these sequences, we were able to identify uh, genes that may explain the, the child autism in more than half of these families. For example, we identify a mutation that stopped the production of a gene of a, one of the most prominent autism genes called CHD8. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this, uh, this mutation we, we, we see only in the child, but don't see it in, in his parents, meaning that this is a new mutation that introduced to the child DNA after conception, possibly due to some environmental uh, exposure or insult. In another example, in another family, we, we, we identify a mutation that changed uh, the, the function of another autism gene called SYNGAP1 that is very important for brain development. And in this example, both parents of this child carry one copy of disrupted uh, gene and one copy of intact gene, but the child inherited both a uh, disrupted copy of the gene, meaning it doesn't have any functional form of this gene in his brain. So I'm also interested in, in uh, environmental risk factor. And in this aspect, I'm focusing on uh, the pregnancy and birth period, which are critical period for brain development. Uh, we take advantage for the, of the fact that more than 90% of the children uh, in our database were born at uh, Soroka Hospital. And we examine this, uh, the, the birth record, the pregnancy and birth records of these children in order to identify uh, risk factors for autism. One example of such risk factor uh, is presented in a, paper, in a paper we published just last week. Uh, we, we, sh we, we, we showed or we found that uh, delivery in cesarean section increased the risk of having autism in 40% compared to, to children who were born in vaginal delivery. And this, is, this kind of association be between cesarean section and autism is something that Many other studies and many other labs already uh, identified or showed, uh, but nobody understood why, why we see this kind of, of association between cesarean section and autism. So digging into, deeply into the, the uh, birth records of these children, we, we actually were able to show that not all cesarean section increased the risk of autism, but only those that, are, uh, that were conducted with general anesthesia increase the risk, while those that are conducted with uh, regional anesthesia do not increase the risk of autism. We further show that this association is not because of the birth complication or, or delivery complication that are associated with general anesthesia. As you can see here, that both surgery that were elective and those that were indicated by the physician uh, increase, have the same risk of autism, and both of them are conducted with general anesthesia. A unique aspect, a unique aspect, aspect of, of our uh, database is that both genetics and environmental factor are available for the same children. This allows us to uh, try to identify unique combination of gene and environmental factors that may increase the risk of autism. And we are now starting to look for this kind of, of, of combination. And, and this aspect of, or this capacity is very unique on a global scale. Very few labs or very few uh, centers, autism centers in the world, have this capacity to have both genetic and environmental factors and look for these kind of interactions. So I'm also interested in, in identifying uh, biological and physiological uh, markers for autism. For example, facial characteristics, like you see in this picture. We know that a lot of genetic syndromes have unique facial characteristics, as you may recognize on, on this picture, uh, uh, photos of children with, with Down syndrome. We suspected that children with autism might also have some unique character facial characteristics. And in order to study this, we, we collaborated with a, an Israeli startup called FDNA that developed a, a unique facial recognition technology that examine uh, children's photos and try to identify unique characteristics in their faces. So we use this technology to, in, uh, to analyze the facial photos of children in our center and compare them to children 
with no autism that we uh, recruited to this study. And when we compare these photos of these two groups, what we saw that this technology can identify children with autism with more than 90% accuracy. And this is amazing. And, and, and this is very, we, we repeatedly see this, uh, this result. And you can think that the implication of this result is huge, are huge. First of all, we can use this technology for autism screening. Second of all, it helps us to, uh, to understand better the biology and physiology uh, mechanism that are associated with uh, autism development. So at this point, if we are talking about the uh, biological mechanism, it's a great point to uh, introduce you to Professor Hava Golan, um, uh, which is the real scientist in our uh, group. <laughs> Hava uh, actually uh, studied autism, uh, autism in, in mouse models, and uh, by this she's, she's able to uh, elucidate the biological rationale of all the findings I already showed you here. So, Hava, please. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it's a real uh, honor to be here and share with you some of the preclinical studies we are doing in our group. Uh, so, autism uh, developmental disorder was sailed already today. Uh, that's the prenatal period, the period in utero during the time that the, the embryo or the fetus is developed in the uterus is the most sensitive period when cells, neurons can get wrong decisions and uh, by doing these uh, uh, mistakes in decision making uh, they can contribute to aberrant development of uh, neuronal circuits later on uh, we can find them in uh, some of the autistic children. So saying that, I point to the, uh, the environment uh, during pregnancy to be most critical for uh, future development. And uh, co uh, co uh, for example, uh, different conditions in this period, like uh, lack of oxygen, uh, inflammation, infection, uh, exposure to uh, drugs or exposure to anesthesia, as uh, uh, Idan just mentioned, or a poor availability of nutrients uh, can be really critical for the long-term uh, development and lead to a, a very um, disrupted outcome. Uh, so in the short time uh, that uh, I choose, uh, I will uh, present you here uh, from all these uh, different factors that I mentioned that we develop for them animal models uh, uh, to search each, each of these factors in isolation, I choose the most uh, a fascinating project which is dealing with uh, low availability of uh, nutrients during uh, pregnancy that is due to a, a genetic cause. So a, a change in a gene or a, a deficiency in a gene uh, that is uh, in charge of incorporation of folic acid to the metabolic pathway that produce from it metabolites, that some of them are very critical for gene regulation, was shown to be uh, increasing the risk for autism. And this gene is called MTHFR. I don't expect you to remember it, but uh, some people are familiar with it, so that's why uh, I mention it. Uh, so we use these uh, animal models actually to uh, study how uh, the brain is uh, developed differently. So this uh, uh, flow chart uh, that I uh, draw here is just trying to illustrate the flow of work when we design an animal model and try to translate it uh, to recommendations for we, uh, humans. So first, of course, we induce the genetic difference or uh, uh, induce other uh, environmental factor test for autistic behavior according to the definitions or the main domains of behavior that are known for children, uh, confirming uh, the behavior relevance for autism, we can harvest the tissue, look into the brains and look for uh, changes in cellular, uh, genetic, epigenetic mechanism and look for a pathway that is distinctly disturbed in the mice that were affected compared to those that have no syndromes. 
Uh, and in the case of uh, uh, poor nutrients, uh, we can develop diets that met the needs of these children. If they cannot use folic acid, for example, that is very critical for brain development, we should supply them with something alternative that they can use for the same purpose. And if everything is optimized and personalized, for the mice needs and successfully rescuing their phenotype, we can go to the translational stage. So you probably ask yourself, how can you define or how you can look for uh, autistic behaviors in animals or in mice in particular? Uh, so I chose one of the tests that is uh, actually a gold standard in many laboratories that uh, study autism where we let the mouse search free the area here, the arena, and it can choose to spend time with an empty box or with a box where it has a friend that is a novel to him, he don't know it. And uh, we can, the uh, other day, uh, suggest uh, the interaction with a familiar mouse versus a novel mouse that he never met before. Imagine yourself walking into the room, meeting a friend, or someone that uh, looks to you very, very interesting. So you can do selections. And when you, we videotape this uh, test, we can later on track where the mouse spent the time uh, during the test. And this one, which is a social mouse, spent most of the time exploring uh, this mouse here, like we can see now. Or a social mouse will probably prefer to be in the empty side or maybe in the central compartment. So this is one tool. Something more realistic is free interaction between two mice where uh, we can look at social gestures between them, record uh, the vocalization during the test. Here is an example of this vocalization, how much they communicate with each other. So test for other features of uh, um, autism and associate the symptoms as they were mentioned before help us to categorize syndromatic mice versus non-syndromatic mice and maybe some uh, intermediate uh, phenotypes. So here is an example of a study that we just published recently uh, where we tested the mother versus the offspring deficient, uh, genetic deficiency and we can see here the experiment course in white are the non-syndromatic mice, uh, mother that are wild type, healthy mothers, with, uh, and their offspring which are also wild type, healthy, and none of them show autistic uh, features. And in the mothers that have the genetic deficiency, about half of the uh, uh, pups uh, show uh, autistic behavior. So since we know that in these mice the deficiency is related to the nutrients, we supplied before pregnancy and during pregnancy the mother, the deficient mother, with a, a complementary diet. And we can see here that the proportion of uh, syndromatic mice was reduced significantly. And more surprisingly even, is the result when we supply the same diet uh, at the, during lactation at the first postnatal uh, months, and still we saw this reduction in the phenotype. So what we do next, I mentioned, it's not so pleasant, but we harvest the tissue, we look at the brains, and we look for ch molecular changes and cellular changes in pathways that are critical for their behavior. And in addition, of course, we look for the nutrients uh, that we thought were disrupted. And we found a significant correlation between some of the nutrients and the symptomatic behavior. And uh, uh, one molecular pathway uh, pop out uh, most significant to be uh, uh, attenuated in the brains of the symptomatic mice. So from here, we are ready to look at their blood and look for markers that can hint which of the mice, or in the future, which of the kids will benefit for this intervention. So here we are back in this uh, flow chart, and now we are in this uh, part of the chart. In order to translate it, we need the genetic that uh, Idan is looking at uh, of these children. It's not only the gene that I mentioned, but several genes on the same metabolic pathways were indicated for autism. Next, we need to look that the metabolites are really uh, impaired, and that can be also due to problem in the uh, um, absorption of the folic acid or other nutrients, uh, um, 
problems in feeding in, uh, that is frequently found in these uh, children and identified which population of children can benefit from uh, this dietary intervention. So we expect the part of our children will be those that uh, will be benefit from the diet and still we have to personalize it to the metabolic needs of each of these uh, children. So, to go in this direction, we're just uh, ready to begin to collect uh, biological samples in the National Autism Biobank, that is part of the Soroka Medical Center uh, Biobank, which is part of a national initiative called the MIDGAM, uh, which is an initiative that uh, um, was established by the Ministry of Health to collect tissue from patients that will help both to uh, design treatment and to understand the uh, cause of different uh, diseases. And this is excellent op optimistic point to present Gal Meiri, the child psychiatry, uh, psychiatry of the Negev, and really the heart of our uh, center because uh, he really shows us how much our work is important for the kids and the families, as Raz mentioned before. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I'm actually graduated from BGU. I started my med school at 1988. And I have also to mention, I didn't plan it, that this was partially by a generous support that I got a scholarship from maybe one of you, I don't know. So uh, as this goes uh, uh, way back, uh, most of my adult life are here in the Negev, and it's, I'm, I'm really excited to be here now and to see how the university uh, grew in the last few years and to be part of this really uh, revolution, actually, that we are involved in. Uh, so actually, uh, talking about compassion and uh, diagnosing and treating uh, and, uh, and do follow-ups visits for autistic uh, kids, that's my main job for for the last more than two decades now and all the time I was involved in some in some research but uh, uh, at the same time was at the point of really sometimes embarrassed in front of parents that are trying to ask me what should I do how should I treat my child how did it happen and if you are a Jew was it my fault uh, so uh, at many times people of course are looking for explanations for that I couldn't really give them. So science and the medical world uh, have still only partial answers to those big, really big uh, questions. But I hope that with this center, we'll have better understanding of the reasons and hopefully better solutions. So Soroka was mentioned here a few times. Uh, I work in Soroka, this, this is my place of work for the last two decades, uh, more than that. Uh, it's a regional tertiary community hospital. It's the only major hospital in the Negev, as you heard about the data that we can collect, more than a million people. Uh, and uh, we have the unit that I established 17 years ago, the preschool psychiatric unit. It's actually the only professional service in the district with this title. We have also the child development center that is also involved with us with, with, the, research, with the research. And I see kids with autism, but not only autism, also other uh, psychiatric uh, and emotional uh, problems. But about a quarter of the referrals that, that we get are for children that are referred uh, with suspected autism. So we see, I see, and my team see approximately 150 new diagnoses uh, of children with uh, every year. Every session like that that starts uh, with giving the diagnosis for young parents, sometimes it's their third children, sometimes it could be their first child. And I just had a session like that this morning with the parent asking me, we are still don't know if to get pregnant again. We don't know if we can really see what are the chances? We, we got some genetic counseling, but they were not accurate enough for us. We, we don't know if we can really struggle or deal again with another autistic child. So again, hopefully genetic research will give us better answer. We are still giving some vague answers to those parents about general or statistical chances 
uh, and hopefully in the future we, will, we can be more specific and more accurate. So in order to give a good clinical evaluation, you have to do few visits with an interdisciplinary team and, and one big advantage also in service, first in service but also for research, is that we do the annual follow-up and as Ilan mentioned before, this annual follow-up is also giving us a chance to do some research and to, and to see some objective measures of the progress of the children. Uh, what we do also uh, in terms of service to the community is to do the medical counseling and support for early intervention uh, programs. And actually those kindergartens are also interested to be involved in research. So we are trying now to see how can we get some of those measurements like audio and video recording, of, of course, after the parents will agree to that. Uh, and we can see some of the procedures that are d uh, done in the, in the kindergarten, in the natural surrounding of the child. I also try to uh, be involved in uh, committees and, and boards uh, locally and uh, nationally in order to give uh, my professional view and to try to get more services uh, and resources to the, to the Negev and to the children and to the families. Uh, in terms of uh, clinical research, we did a small study about omega-3. Uh, we did see some improvement. We are now trying to see what, what is this something about medical cannabis. I first heard about it like many others and got some uh, uh, negative ideas about it, and that many parents were actually saying, you know, this is, was really helpful for, for my child, but still, in the States and worldwide, no real big studies, randomized control studies about uh, medical cannabis for autistic children. Uh, as for today, there is no biological cure for autism. Of course, we are talking about something that might help a little bit to uh, reduce some of the symptoms, so we plan to do this uh, study and we're actually waiting for the last committee at the Ministry of Health uh, to get the, the approval. We also try to see, and we have, did publish some studies about the existing uh, medications to see their uh, uh, efficacy, side effects, and maybe to see if we can uh, do what we call today in the medical world, evidence-based personalized medicine, to see to which child which treatment will be better. The, the follow-up visits actually uh, give us this very nice uh, opportunity to do a follow-up also measurements of, of the kids. So the ADOS, for example, is the most reliable test clinically and research for autism. And as you can see here on the graph, most of the children that were taking the ADOS upon diagnosis and one year later actually were better after one year. Most of them are under the curve. Most of them uh, improved. Uh, and this is very encouraging. And the nice uh, fact about really having hundreds or maybe in the future thousands of uh, children in our database could actually give us the option to analyze which kind, which subgroups improved better and uh, what treatment helped to improve. Another project that we are proud of is what we did with the, with the Bedouin community. The Bedouin community, um, uh, more than a quarter of a million of people uh, among the high, uh, highest birth rates in, in the world, uh, and about a third of them are uh, not in any village or a city, just around the hills here, a uh, nomadic lifestyle with high rates of intrafamilial marriages. And when I just established the unit about 15 years ago, uh, in, in a year or two, I, uh, I saw that I don't get any referrals from, I didn't get any referrals for, for kids with uh, suspected autism from the Bedouin community. Um, so we initiated a project with the Ministry of Health. Some of you might be familiar with the uh, Tipot Chalav, the mother infant clinics in, in Israel. It's also in the Bedouin community and they tend to comply and they tend to come to those visits of immunization and developmental checkups. And this is a, a, gate, a gate actually also to interventions and to early screening. So we were able to approach them to do some training, to, do, to reach out to the community, to talk with 
professional people, nurses, physicians, and also with parents. And actually, with Suleiman Abuhani, the, uh, the nurse that actually dedicated his, I would say, the rest of his career, because he's about to retire, uh, uh, more than a decade now, involved, highly involved with me with that. And as you can see on the, on the graphs, uh, it, the, the first years of this project, the, from almost zero, we got high um, a prevalence or more referrals. And we also saw what is very important in autism, the average age of referral decreased, which actually means we can uh, find it earlier and we can intervene earlier and we can probably get a better, uh, better results. Uh, these days, uh, in Soroka, which is actually the biggest hospital uh, in, in Israel in terms of uh, labor, uh, labors 17,000 a year, half of them are of Bedouin children, half of them are, are of Jewish families, uh, and you can see the referrals are quarter and three quarters. So uh, we still need to look into it. We are much better than the zeros that we had uh, 15 years ago. Uh, and we have la now more than 200 uh, children uh, that are actually diagnosed with autism from the Bedouin community, which enables them to open uh, new schools and new kindergartens. Uh, uh, and still, we need to identify what are the reasons that we le have less referrals than uh, the, the general population, and maybe also to find their specific and distinct features. For example, we were able to find the two tribes from the veteran community had higher prevalence than others of autism, which goes back to the genetic question, uh, and we are now looking into it to see if we can find something specific for these two tribes. Hopefully, finding those really specific subtypes clustering in the Bedouin and in the Jewish community and in the general population will enable us to actually find a better understanding of the reasoning and better solutions and treatments. And at this point, I will let Ilan to continue. So I'm just going to wrap it up a bit. Um, so I hope you get a feeling for this heterogeneity and of, of the researchers um, and, and how we, we complement each other and, and really look at autism from different angles. And so I think this, uh, this shared database, this complementary science is what uh, made the Ministry uh, of Science choose us uh, for, for this revolutionary center uh, that we're creating. And um, so I started out, you know, the, the talk saying that we beat all of our competitors and isn't that wonderful, but actually in order to create a, a national center, uh, we need all of them as partners. And so the first thing uh, that I did after we won this thing is to drive all over Israel to each one of these centers and, and, and uh, switch the theme from competition to uh, collaboration. And this is uh, uh, really important if we are to realize this vision of turning Israel into an international leader in autism research. And we're pushing this vision of, of uh, a strong focus on, on early ages, early diagnosis and developing new technologies and treatments for autism. We're going to realize that, that vision through uh, by building a, a national database, which is going to be just an expanded version of what uh, you already heard about. Uh, we're developing infrastructure that uh, the idea is that we want to help each researcher and clinician in Israel who wants to do any type of research about autism. We want to have them approach us and, and for us to solve problems and facilitate the, the things that impede their research right now, so to provide services to everyone. We're doing a lot of community outreach, and I want to say a few words about fostering a, a cooperative environment that I already uh, just mentioned. So in February of this year, we had the first national autism meeting here in, in the same room where we're sitting right now. And it was actually a huge success. What you see here in, in this picture are uh, of the 120 people who were here. These are the ones who made it until 8 p.m. Um, and so, so we, had, we intentionally held the, the meeting in Hebrew without any international visitors. We all got to know each other. And we had very important roundtable discussions about how to build this national center and what should be in the national database. And this resulted in a white paper uh, that includes all these different measures. And we are already establishing additional sites throughout Israel. Uh, we just got clearance to start collecting data in Asafa Rofe, which is a major medical center next to Rishon. 
uh, were in the process in Tel Hashomer and, and also in Jerusalem. Between these four sites in Israel, uh, it's my guess that within a year we'll be able to collect data from over a thousand new cases of autism every year. And that's the majority of autism cases in Israel that puts us on a totally different level uh, of, of doing research both in, in, in an international scale. Um, okay, I'll skip over the community outreach because we're a little short on time. Um, what I really want to finish with is, is thanking uh, a bunch of really important people. So this is, this is a, a good opportunity to thank both uh, the vice presidents for uh, research and development, both uh, Professor Dan Bloomberg, who finished his position last year, and Professor Razielnik, who took over. We've had amazing support from both of them in uh, developing these efforts. And then a really big thanks to Professor Ramos Katz, who um, is uh, the, the dean of uh, the health sciences faculty. So we are both the autism hub in the hub program for the faculty. And, and just as important, all of the work that we do is in real estate that's located in the hospital and that is part of, of the faculty and has been given generously to us. And of course, uh, both the former president, uh, Professor Rivka Kami and Professor uh, Daniel Chaimovic, whose support is, is just endless and wonderful. Um, and then the funding agencies and the donors who are, uh, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without them. And the most important ones chose to remain anonymous. So, so thank you very much for your attention, and I hope we don't go too much overboard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>